So thanks very much, uh, Alex, for giving me the opportunity again to speak at this great event. Uh, obviously, I was here at Barcelona last year. Really enjoyed it, meeting everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces, which is always very nice. And I have uh, my new partner in crime, Baz Van Kam, here, who I'll be speaking with about uh, some FMA internals power management stuff tomorrow. So really looking forward to that. Also really happy when Alex <laughs> told me that I would have some support for this session. Uh, because the phrase, could I be any less prepared, kind of comes to mind a little bit. Yeah, but that's what Pump Form that's what Pump Form is all about. So I'm very happy. And even working on this deck late last night, uh, I was scrambling. And I had a bit of an accident with the iron this morning as well. That's why I, I'm, I'm in a casual t-shirt, but uh, it feels good anyway. So very happy to be here, for sure. Uh, let's push on. We may have to go through some of the stuff pretty quickly. So I call this deck the state of the nation, really, Citrix 2015, because I think it was, uh, it's quite appropriate uh, phrase, really, because uh, we've come to an interesting period uh, in, in the world of Citrix, for sure. So uh, I think it was an interesting, I know feedback on the event itself was quite, from what I'm gathering, is quite mixed, which is, I guess, sometimes the case. I think there was a lot of interesting stuff which came out of uh, the keynote on day one and, and Synergy in general, although it may be a little bit underwhelming at the same time. But like what, prep your demo? Yeah, well, <laughs> that just made it more fun, right? More cringy, I should say. But I still think there was some interesting stuff going on. Watching it again last night, replay of, of the, uh, the keynote, there was some interesting stuff that came to mind. Some of the latest messaging, of course. You know, I think Citrix now are coming around to the idea of, of it not all being about desktops anymore, right? So we've kind of come full circle. We're now talking about applications. Obviously, one of the big things we're talking about now is workspaces. So workspaces is the big thing, okay? So there's probably a lot of people here wondering what uh, Citrix Cloud workspace is all about. So I'm hoping one of these CTPs here will be able to help me out when we get to that section. You've done your research? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might have to set up a bit of a clinic tomorrow to talk more about CWC uh, when I am a little bit more prepared, but uh, we'll see how that goes anyway. So really, obviously, Citrix now, some of the key concepts and discussions, we're talking about any app, any device, any cloud, of course. We're talking about the software-defined work workplace. Okay, with the workspace being the engine. So all of a sudden, workspace has become uh, the kind of buzzword right now. So it's all about workspaces. Of course, we talked about workspaces, you know, for, we've talked about workspaces for a long time, but it's very prevalent now. And Citrix is all about talking about this new definition. You heard Mark at the keynote talking about Citrix competitors and their definition of a, of a workspace and what it is, essentially a desktop, uh, a virtualized desktop. But obviously, Mark and Citrix, the vision is that a workspace is a lot more than just a desktop, okay? It's, it's any type of digital tool or any type of environment you need to get the job done, whether it's a, a Windows-based app, a web app, a mobile app, a collaborative workspace. That's what Citrix believes is the new definition of a workspace. So this is the type of messaging which was coming out of, uh, of the event. And when Mark talked about the and, that probably threw a lot of people as well. It's a, a strange concept, but that's what it is. And, and that's what Citrix believes a workspace is. So it's a desktop app and a mobile app and a collaborative, a collaborative app, et cetera, et cetera. So that pretty much is what uh, has come out of this. And of course, you remember this slide from the keynote. And Citrix wants to obviously partner up with everybody and be the workspace provider. So you can see, I'm sure everybody's well aware of, of the product Citrix has released over the last couple of years. You know, uh, obviously there's major focus on mobility, cloud networking. You can definitely feel it, you know, working for Citrix inside of the organization. You can definitely see that apps and desktops are still important, but a lot of the focus internally is on mobility, networking, and the cloud side of things. So you obviously, as industry people and partners, notice that as well. But we definitely notice that in, internally in Citrix. So Citrix are building a portfolio of products to be able to partner up with people uh, for the new age uh, of the mobile worker and workspace. So that's pretty important. So we have to address the elephant in the room, the big red heart. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so a little bit cringy maybe, but uh, the sentiment is there. The sentiment is, is, is real. And of course, uh, just to recap briefly, we talked about Zenapp, of course, because I think I was, yeah, I think so Mark and a lot of the guys 
I think there's been some mistakes made along the road. Uh, I think they screwed up. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think fuck up is more <laughs> the correct more, word. Exactly. Well, that was my sentiment as somebody who works internally in Citrix as well. You know, you, you spend 20 years building a, a product and a reputation yeah. and uh, you don't really decide to just throw it away overnight, right? But well, the shift is good, right? I remember a couple of years ago in Barcelona that it took two and a half hours into the keynote for the word Senap to be mentioned somewhere. And like, Senap. Yeah. Then we went on. And now it was, you know, gets love and attention. So exactly. I like that. That's good. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So that's everybody's happy about that then? Yeah. yeah. Senap getting a lot of attention. Okay. So that, let's talk about what Mark spoke about, and that's the. Uh, well, we talked about it in a moment, actually. So we definitely got a lot of love. Zen app, I think people were, were happy with that. Sure. A little too late? Surely not, right? There's always time for redemption, okay? So bringing it back. I think even on the FMA side of things, even though I, I'm sure most people in the room here understand that <coughs> when we talk about FMA, even today I talk more about version numbers than Zen app and Zen desktop. When I talk about 7.6, it's more FMA 7.6 to me. Because that's what it is. It's an architecture. It's a platform. Zen apps and desktop, it's, it's not as important. You know, it's about resources and delivering resources. But at least we, we introduced the name again you know, with the introduction of, of 7.5. So Zen app 7.5 and Zen desktop 7.5. Under the hood, it's the exact same architecture, same binaries, of course. But you know, we start to make people feel good about the product. But when we talk about legacy Zen app, of course, you know, we are talking pretty much about what we believe is hands down the most powerful way to deliver Windows applications and shared hosted desktops. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. Uh, this was news to me, over 1 million apps published, which I thought was quite interesting. And I suppose the big news from a support point of view is that 6.5 has been extended until 2017, right? With the extended support still in line with Windows 2008 or 2 in you know, 2020. So it still aligns there, but we still have more support for 6.5, which I think is a good thing, because we obviously would have been end of life, end of support next year in 2016. So we get an extra year. I don't know what your, your thoughts are on this. In 2030, there will still be people running ZenApp 6.5, just like there's still people running Metaframe 1.8 today. OK. Good, good. And there are still people running the original multi-user OS2 released in 1990, still running that today. Yeah, OK. Yeah, but so you don't I have no doubt. your lab with that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> but those are all not supported, right? Yeah. So from, from a support perspective, this is good. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Your lab is obviously not supported anymore. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but how do people, how do you guys feel about, because we know that ZenApp 6.5 is only supported on 2008 or 2, so no 2012 support. So how does that impact what customers are going to do? For me, it shows that all roads lead to FMA, sooner rather than later, of course, you know. But you feel customers will pay extended support for from Microsoft and stay on a platform that yeah. they've customized and are happy yeah. with and yeah, maintain? So I think it also well. gives them time to recover, sorry, from the 7.0, 7.1, 7.5, 7.6, all these versions. <laughs> and we seem to be going back to future pack releases, Yeah, hopefully. Mm. Um, so you know, if you're a large enterprise, you cannot update even if it's a minor version uh, that often. So yeah. I think a lot of people backed away. Waited. Now this confirms them the platform will be supported for quite some time, yeah. and then they can plan a migration to Vnext. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because infrastructure and platform components are uh, upgrading at a faster pace than applications, so you see a lot of enterprises are getting into trouble because they have to support older versions for the applications that they are running. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it will give us some time. Excuse me. I have news on that. Uh, it was published, I think, uh, on Tuesday. Um, the launch from Tripac 3 is on the 29th of June. You've ruined my uh, big surprise. Oh. Uh, that's OK. Uh, Audience participation is important. <laughs> so, there must be a mole in Citrix. And how did you get this breaking news? <laughs> no, it was. Uh, Announced, was it? Probably. I mean, it was maybe. An official announcement, and it's. Um, OK. Central. Okay, very good. So, um, well, my understanding was it was the 30th of June, and I was going to let people know, of course. And um, they're releasing all the stuff. So um, there was also a future pack for 
Uh, yeah, so pretty much, yeah, pretty much, the, well, what I thought was the 30th, you're saying the 29th, we, we won't argue over it, but that's obviously going to be the big date, right, the end of June. Uh, so that's what we can look forward to, and not just ZenApp 6 5 Feature Pack 3, but of course uh, a couple of other things as well, which we'll talk about now in a moment, especially the latest FMA Feature Pack, 7 6 Feature Pack 2. Uh, but just to talk about what Rempo was saying, uh, Remco, sorry, internally, yeah, I am noticing that as well. We do have a, a big release of FMA at the end of the year, where there will be code changes on the broker end, on the back end components. So that's kind of our next big release. But so far this year, it's all been kind of feature packs, right? And uh, we're going to have some VDA releases in Q3 to tie in with Windows 10 support. And so there's going to be just component releases. A lot of it is kind of component releases now. So you pick the pieces you want to integrate, but your back end infrastructure kind of stays as it is. So that's pretty much what we have. You may not be aware, but, and I don't think it's available right now, and of course all you guys are under NDA, but in terms of what you're getting with 6.5 Feature Pack 3, I don't know if people have seen this, or I don't think you'd be aware, but of course the X1 components, the experience first components, you get them of course with ZenApp and Zen Desktop 7.6 Feature Pack 2 as well. So that's the new storefront, all the new receivers which support that. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Real-time optimization pack. I think Citrix are doing a lot of great work here with the optimization pack. I don't know what, what you guys feel. You know, I don't have to talk about the numbers. Internally, we hear a lot of marketing about over 100 million seats deployed of, of MS Link, 90 of 100 Fortune, 100 companies using it. So to be able to optimize that in a virtualized environment, I think, is, 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 is really good. Do you guys have any strong opinions on that either way? Or? <laughs> Does that help sell uh, Zen App and Zen Desktop seats? Mm. Not so much, anybody? Mm. Does it make um, it work better? Yeah. Nah. Yeah, it's a yeah. more interesting question. <laughs> do, do you want to come up here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a special guest. Join the, the gang. So I asked uh, if you might know that Microsoft has renamed Link to uh, Skype for Business. That's right. And I asked Citrix, what about integration? Because it's a bit different to it, Link. The UI and everything as well. Yeah, the UI is different. And I asked Citrix a question, so what about Skype for Business? They told me, uh, yes, kind of. We just support the old school Link type, and we are working on this. But there is no ETA or something? It was Q3, it was Q3 policy. Uh, could be. So I asked them what about when it should be released, and they said uh, the only thing they're supporting is the link mode and not the official Skype mode. So it actually works, but it's just unsupported. It's just unsupported. Yeah. But it does work. Yeah, but, uh, yeah there was a disclaimer. I worked for Citrix as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, come up here then. <laughs> come up here then. Actually, everybody should just come up. Everybody, we can all just. Can I, can I, can I go on? <laughs> or, or should we call you Justin? Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the new features briefly. We can in a moment, but obviously the support for for Mac devices, Link 2013, is a big one as well, yeah. with the optimization pack 1.8. So that's quite interesting. A couple of new components. So this is what you're going to get once you hit the download page for Feature Pack 3, once it hits RTW on the 29th or 30th. So what else have we got? Obviously, you've got a bunch of other components which are going to be lumped in. You know, it's nothing brand new. A lot of you guys are probably using some of these components already. You know, PVS 7.6 the moonshot support, the, you know, all the stuff we're doing with the cache, the optimization, that type of stuff, the low bouncing across uh, storage of VDisks, all that kind of stuff with PVS 7.6, Zen Server 6.5, SP1. So you're getting all of this nice stuff as well, App DNA, Director, UPM, UPS, and License Server. So this type of stuff is all there as well. So you'll access it all at the download link for 6.5 Feature Pack 3. So what else have we got? Uh, Mark talked a bit about this, I suppose, Project Serenity internally. You guys will remember the migration tool, the XML scripts and PowerShell scripts that you used to run to get old IMA-based stuff over to uh, the FMA platform. So now that's web-based, of course. So there'll also be a link pointing customers who are running legacy ZenApp on IMA to our ZenApp migration service. So I think it works pretty well. Uh, it's nice, it's intuitive, it's quick, it's informative, and it steps you through the whole process. So that's, a, that's something we can look forward to as well. 
So that's Zenap 6.5 feature pack 3. I think generally a good thing. Uh, but I suppose more importantly really is the extended support for Zenap uh, and what we're doing on that side of things. So we figured out that customers love Zenap. Finally. OK. Great. <laughs> so in terms of uh, what else we kind of spoke about on the FMA platform, of course, it's Feature Pack 2, right? Zen App and Zen Desktop uh, 76 Feature Pack 2. Has anybody worked with Feature Pack 1 components? Has anybody taken a look at some of that stuff? Yes. Yeah? I did. OK. And generally, obviously, we had the Link 1.7. We had the session recording. Uh, refresh my memory. What else did we have with Feature Pack 1? Oh uh, my god, my mind has gone completely blank. CTPs? The licensing server was also new. Uh, oh, yes. Be a bit careful because the only new feature of the licensing server is the calling home function. Oh, yes, yes. You can uh, you can do, so you can select do I want to call home or not. OK, OK. At the end, I'll, I'll try and have a look. My mind is just gone a little bit blank on Feature Pack 1. But as a natural extension to that, obviously, we're moving on to Feature Pack 2 now. Internally in Citrix right now, that is actually, that's one of my jobs. I've been creating the training modules for our support engineers on Feature Pack 2. So if we can take a look here, uh, obviously, it's a, section, a second kind of functional and minor release is what we would consider. You know, Remco's talking about you know, moving to a feature pack release model. That's essentially what this is, to bridge the gap between Arctur 7.6 and 7.7, .7, which we hope to see at the end of the year, right? So it's a bunch of components. Internally, we, we work these components under Project K2. And again, similar to feature pack one, there's no major broker change. There's no code change as such. In well, saying, there is a big change coming. Well, in saying that, yeah, tell me. With PVS 7.7. Okay. They're finally getting rid of that piece of shit PowerShell. <laughs> the CLI. They're actually coming up with actual real PowerShell for PVS 7.7. Yeah. Okay. Which Very good. I was working on until I was rudely interrupted and told okay. to come up here. I've actually uh, been working with Citrix on it since September. Okay. But I was not even allowed to even tell the other CTPs I even had access to it. Okay. But okay. now they started talking about it at Synergy, so I said, yeah. okay, I must be uh, free to talk about it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I, haven't even, I wasn't even aware or even focused on 7.7, 7, so it's... Yeah, 7.7, 7, PVS 7.7 7 is nice. Yeah, okay, okay. And the PowerShell is really nice because it's actually real PowerShell. Okay. And okay. my documentation okay. script will be ready Similar. when... 7.7 7 is actually released. Okay. I'll have the documentation script ready to go the same day. So similar kind of SDK level to what we're doing with FMA. I have no idea what an SDK is. What's an SDK? <laughs> <laughs> all, I know, all I know is this real object-oriented PowerShell. Okay. Yeah, string it's crap. It's thing without PowerShell, so without WMI. I took my notes from Synergy about yeah. it's new in 7.6 feature for Quant, so if you just want... Yeah, if you go ahead, yeah, yeah. Session pre-launch, session linger, connection releasing, broker throttling, unauthenticated user access, anonymous user sessions. But that was said. That was actually seven six. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's seven six. It was a session I attended. It was a lab with you in seven six feature pack one. Oh, maybe they, maybe they got confused. I think they, most. I think they, they bundled it together. Okay, maybe, but most of the things you're mentioning were were out in seven six. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, new director features, rising thing alerts. Application usage report. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. You know what we can do really quickly? So with all this um, versioning soup, uh, with <laughs> versions, feature packs running all across together, um, customers need, actually we need, uh, an up-to-date matrix that says which versions are supported together. Because if they are present, they're not really updated so, um, uh, regularly. Um, so there's, I think, lots of demand for that. Okay. Lots of things are great. Yeah, so there we can see it there, actually. So we didn't have a huge amount, really. The session recording and troubleshooting, the SRT stuff, true director, OK? So f from the compliance point of view, there was director updates to integrate session recording so you could record sessions inside of director, which is quite nice, that type of thing. The link optimization pack, it says 2.0. You ig ignore that. It's 1.7, of course. And uh, the license server update as well with all the call home and CEIP stuff. So that was quite interesting. OK, so that was pretty small, really. So getting back to the, uh, I suppose this is a slightly larger feature pack, really. And if we look at the features, I'm sure you, some of you guys have probably already looked at the tech preview for the Linux VDA. If we can just get a show of hands, have, have many people looked at the Linux VDA? A few people? Okay. <laughs> Does everybody know it's multi-user? 
So it's basically ZenApp on Linux, not just single session. Okay. That's that's good. It's shared hosted desktops at the moment is all we're supporting, right? So, okay, the multi-user. I, we, I, we've been talking about desktops and apps. We're not there with apps just yet. So what, one of the things I was thinking, if, yeah. if we have an old Windows app that we somehow need to support, can we run it on Wine on a Linux VDA? <laughs> Quit all the licensing bullshit? <laughs> Ooh. But there, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. couldn't possibly comment on that. Uh, no, not yet, not yet. But I know if it works on Wine, it should work with the VDA, right? Because it's just adding and remoting stuff. Um, yeah. Might not work multi multi user though, but um, I think yeah. there were some interesting use cases there. The interesting thing is that there is also a setup for Unix out there, which uh, supports AX. Uh, Solaris and uh, HPUX. HPUX. But this is different. The Linux build is different. Yeah, because this is Susie, Red Hat, and. Yeah, we have to pass the mic. Something. Yeah. We have to pass that mic along <laughs> to anyone who wants to speak. So sorry about that. We'll try and speak a little bit louder. Okay, sorry guys. I'll walk down here a little bit, give you some attention. I'll point up to my esteemed colleagues up here. So as you can see, we got some interesting stuff going on. I think the Linux VDA is definitely interesting. It's step one, really. Some basic functionality, graphics, keyboard, mouse. You know, a lot of the advanced virtual channels, they won't be implemented until further down the line. You know, there's no provisioning. There's no MCS. It's shared hosted desktops only. Uh, a limited amount of supported distributions, Red Hat and Suzy. Although if you want to work it internally, you can use CentOS. 6.6 because .6, it matches kind of the code of Red Hat, so that's quite interesting. Uh, it's tr for me, being a Windows guy, it's tr it was tricky to get going, so I'm going to write a blog. A lot of funky stuff going on on, on, on the Linux oh, uh, OS itself, but I got there. Framehawk integration, you guys will remember we announced this back in 2014, the acquisition, with the Citrix's eyes firmly on the mobile workspace and optimizing performance uh, through those variable uh, mobile connections. So it's just improvements in, uh, in the whole tin wire side of things. So one uh, technical detail worth mentioning, because you mentioned virtual channels and yeah. Framehawk in, uh, right after each other. Framehawk uses a virtual channel, which is fine. Yeah. It works nicely. Uh, in my testing, the latest receiver uses 30 <coughs> of the 32 virtual channels out of the box, meaning there are two left for other applications to use. If you add Framehawk, there will be one left. Okay. Uh, I know that RES uses at one or two, depending if you use VDX or just Workspace Manager. Uh, if you run out of virtual channels, you will notice nothing except it doesn't work. It doesn't give you an error. It doesn't give you any warning. So just keep it in mind. If you run into virtual channel stuff, quite likely you run out of uh, okay. channels. And there is no change coming up to extend this uh, beyond 32. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that RAM code, so that's that's quite interesting. It's something I can definitely bring back to the PMs, and and uh, so I'll have to I'll take a note of that. We can talk after. Uh, Is there a release date for Framehawk? So Framehawk ties in with Zen App and Zen Desktop feature pack two, so it's going to be the 30th of June. So pretty much everything we're kind of speaking about right now, the next big date is, is the 30th of June or the 29th of June, 29th, 30th, I guess. Uh, End of June. Yeah, end of June, <laughs> a exactly. So framework integration will bring us the bandwidth stuff. It will, in my opinion, sadly not bring us the user experience improvements, like uh, if you zoom in a Word document that you make the text bigger and not the whole thing. And if you pinch and zoom, uh, all that kind of thing, click, yeah. right click. Um, that will not be coming shortly. Okay. You've so obviously played around with it. The, the yes. I, I know it was in the technology that was acquired by Framehawk. Okay. Uh, so I've never actually seen it. Yeah. So I'm comparing to what Parallels Access does. If you remote a Windows app to an iPad, it works much more natively than yeah. Receiver do, uh, does. I would have loved to see that yeah. technology come up sooner. Absolutely. Um, I will hope it will yeah. join later. The idea is that it's Framehawk gives the user the control, really. So you know it, it uses an interruptible uh, graphics model, basically, where the user can interrupt. So if you're scrolling, you don't have to wait for the scroll to finish. You can just interrupt the graphics display, essentially, and uh, obviously move a different direction if you want to. So that's the idea. It uses UDP for performance. So it's not TCP, UDP. Uh, obviously, you need the, the X1 
receivers to be able to use Framehawk as well as an updated VDA. So when we release Feature Pack 2, Framehawk integration will be part of it, but Framehawk itself will have a number of components that you need to integrate. So you've got the VDA, of course, you've got a group policy management update, so you can actually control and manage the actual feature itself. You can turn it off, you can change the port range being used, you have a new receiver, uh, etc., etc. I think I saw a hand, this man. On which codec do you play that? On the new one or the legacy? Only on the new one, I guess. Super codec. That's a good question. Super codec. Okay, there you go. Because on all, all phones we run on the legacy mode. Okay. Even we have 2012. There will, there will also be a method to switch between legacy and, uh, and normal. Oh, okay. that, that's the switcher. The, you're talking about yep, the switcher. Yep, yep. Raya. So I don't even know if they're going to release that switcher. It might end up just being a registry key or something like that. But with Framework, they had this switcher where you could change between the graphics modes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we're giving away too much. Turn off the mic. <laughs> We don't know yet. But anyway, I think Framehawk, I think it's a step in the right direction, you know, with the whole mobility thing. So optimization pack 1.8, of course, we've spoken about that. It's the Skype for Business Link UI support. It's the Link 2013 on Mac. It's a couple of other configuration stuff, uh, some improvements around discovery. Uh, and that's it. And session recording updates. There's just a little bit with session recording update 76100. Essentially, it's integration of the CEIP program, or what we call, uh, yeah, it's the CEIP. So essentially, when you install the latest director, you're going to get the option, do you want to be part of the CEIP program, basically? This is, uh, this is not build 100, this is build 200. My understanding that it's 76100, I, I could be wrong. Yeah, it's 200. It's 200? It's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to update in, in the deck. But basically, the latest version of Director is going to have the CEIP stuff built in. And it's just pretty much going to be reporting on who is actually using session recording. There's nothing else kind of funky being sent back. There's no recordings. There's nothing sensitive. It's just anonymous data based on who is actually using the feature. So that's going to help us, obviously, decide if we want to move forward and, and develop those features. So that's pretty much what we, what we have. You know, we spoke briefly about the X1 components, the Experience First components, Project X1. So these all tie in together. Essentially what we have is Storefront 3.0 with receiver for web. We just have our project names here and then we have a receiver for all our various different uh, platforms. So again, they're all coming on the 29th slash the 30th of June with uh, 6.5 feature pack 3 and 7.6 feature pack 2. Yeah. So we can look forward to that. <coughs> so this was all announced by Mark, of course, at, at Synergy. So what else did we uh, ignore this? Just a bit of talk on Link. So essentially, this is the feature set for Link 1.7, uh, 1.8. You can see it here, support for Skype for Business. Interop with the new Skype for Business client in Link. UI mode for Skype for Business server. We have our Mac support on Link 2013, auto discovery and Kerberos authentication. So that's pretty much where we stand. So we're going to get on to Storefront now in a minute. This is just some of the Framehawk stuff, which I just wanted to cover really quickly. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's UDP based, so for performance reasons, with a big focus on, on, on mobile users. The new virtual channel is there, enabled by HDX policy. We have a default port range of 100, which can be manipulated if we want, and there's interoperability with obviously Gateway 11, Director, CloudBridge, and let's get our HDX insight. So that's Framehawk integration. I think that's quite, quite important. And you can see here we have our new Framehawk location inside of our group policy management engine as well. So we can go in and configure everything right in there. So for the mobile user, I think it's going to be pretty important. So we can jump onto Storefront 3.0 pretty quickly. Uh, <coughs> I guess you guys probably have some strong opinions on, on web interface and storefront and, and what Citrix is doing. Does anybody want to <laughs> lead us off here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the newbie that has to comment. Uh, well, what I do see is that there are still a lot of customers uh, running web interface and are still uh, trying to figure out if Storefront is going to provide them the features that they are accustomed to. Okay. And I think with the Storefront 3.0 uh, release, uh, it will be an even better argument to get them to 
uh, migrate to storefront and Definitely. get the features set that they mm. need. And the important part of that as well that I noticed Mark mentioning at Synergy as well is the fact that we can aggregate yes. multiple versions of Zen app yeah, that's to help, help us migrate across. To, to migrate uh, one component at a time. Yeah, so. exactly. Okay, actually, question to the audience. What do you guys think? Uh, you know, sure, there's a feature parity or disparity, whatever sometimes, right? If the product was called Web Interface 3.0 instead of, let's say, Storefront, yeah. will that ease the migration for the customers? Oh, we're going to start a We Love Web Interface campaign now. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> the ZenApp campaign was successful, right? Yeah. So <laughs> let's go. We have another. Okay. Actually, what, what uh, for me, okay, I was always questioning why Storefront at all. But more than let's not have the same, same uh, really, uh, not a feature set as, as Web Interface, I think that's more important. What is more actually like strange is that this piece of software which you cannot use on normal web application server. You must have you must have iOS, you must have Windows, you cannot use don't use any of internet standards actually. Hey, it's 2015 people, wake up! No, 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 no. So what are you saying? That it should be an appliance? Virtual appliance? Virtual appliance yeah, should be like PHP. It, but in all the flavors. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, if, if you look under the hood, actually talking about the standards, uh, the solution that Citrix has actually XML-wise, you basically get the wire shark and look basically what's passing across the wire. Uh, storefront is very elegant. Yeah. yeah. So if you take a look at the framework, basically, you know, what, you uh, what the endpoints are changes with the, uh, with the, uh, the backend, it's actually way more elegant than what we have. Okay. But still yeah. And besides that, uh, one thing to realize is there are uh, two types of receivers usually, right? Uh, receiver for web, right? And uh, receiver for like regular endpoint. Uh, they use different technologies. So the stuff that actually, if you get under the hood, is very elegant. Yeah, so you'd know he used to work for Citrix, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, Thanks, though. <laughs> but there is a uh, other difference because um, uh, the web interface is based on um, the web interface is based on I think uh, uh, a .NET framework component, which isn't supported J -Sharp. anymore. J -Sharp, J -Sharp. which isn't supported for Microsoft right now. From a Microsoft perspective, there is no support. <laughs> Because Microsoft canceled that this component, okay. so that's the reason why Web Interface, okay, the, the support is extended, okay, but it can't be, let's say, modified because Microsoft canceled it. Yeah, the framework behind it. I think in terms, uh, obviously, my specialization area is FMA, so you know, I, I can't quite go as deep as I'd like to on some of these topics, but. I don't think the same challenges exist with people with getting people to buy into Storefront as they did with getting rid of Zen App and moving everybody to FMA and changing the name and not having the features and stuff like that. So I think eventually, I think this release has made some big strides. It's not there yet, but I think there is some good things. You know, the new UI is very nice. We'll see in a minute we have application folders. There's a lot more organization, customization options as well. Is it possible to migrate from Storefront? That's a good question. Do any of you guys know, can we migrate in place migration from Storefront 2.6 to 3? Uh, I personally okay. did the migration to 2.7, which was the technology before this, yeah. and 3.0, so there was some mixed, mixed success. It was actually cleaner to start with no migration. Okay. Okay. So okay. Right. Right. I haven't looked at it, but so. Yeah, we have to have a pro production product, right? Not a technology. Yeah. yeah. 3.0, like we're waiting for the end of June. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. But I think the new interface and the unification of, that's the whole end goal with Storefront 3.0 and the Project X1 receivers. It's to pretty much unify the receiver and works home client, you know? I think people are sick, that was kind of clear from Synergy as well and Mark's speech, and people are sick of having multiple clients to access their resources. So whether they're mobile or, you know, whether they're in the office, you just need one receiver really. So that's part of this. Obviously the new look and feel is quite nice. Uh, but some of the new features, and this is kind of like the high level stuff really I suppose. We got the new centralized customization and branding, you know, uh, even recently I've had uh, customers querying how do we actually do some corporate branding. Storefront 3.0 makes it a lot easier to do some corporate branding inside of the actual management console itself. If you don't like the new look and feel, you can obviously hit back to the receiver uh, or the, the classic 
UI as well, okay, if you don't want to step forward. I don't know why that's there, but anyway. And then the application, featured app groups, folder view of applications, favorites, etc. So some, just some high level stuff, which kind of make it look quite nice. This is obviously the tech preview. 2.7, you can customize your website experience, of course. Come in here, you can put your logos, your coloring, all that type of stuff. So that's quite nice. <coughs> After that, you have your website selection as well inside of Storefront. So you can do Receiver X1 or Receiver for Web Classic. So that's all there. And finally, I'm sure most people here have seen the, the difference. You know, you have your, you know, your groups, okay? Your, import, your featured types of groups, you can choose the teams and the backgrounds, and then you have your traditional folder view as well. So we're kind of bringing back in some of the web interface functionality at the same time with Storefront 3.0. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So what else have we have? Okay, so I don't know how, how we're doing for time right now, actually. I've completely lost track. Plenty of time. Hopefully we're, uh, well, I'm actually hoping that our time is up. Uh, <laughs> so this is the... That's extra time to talk. Lots of details. About Citrix Workspace out. Cloud. So I'll quote Alex's email to me. What the hell? This was Alex's reference to this. So I'm thankful that I have some interesting people standing up here that can actually talk about this. So personally, like I said earlier, my preparation was not as good as it, it would be. I'm still a little bit in the dark with Cloud's uh, workspace. Uh, what I understand is it's a, a web UI front end. Benny is coming to help you. Oh, Benny, is this your area of expertise? Oh, I'll explain my, my opinion about it. Okay. <laughs> well, let's hear the opinion. We have an opinion. Yeah, I have an opinion. Uh, it, took me, it took me a while to come up with an opinion. Uh, I really like the concept because the thing, moving things to the cloud, this is the way to go, in, con in particular if you're talking about the control layer. Yeah. What uh, Citrix did not make a particularly well job at is explaining people what about the work layer. <laughs> so where do they live? And uh, it was presented like Citrix had a cloud solution where you had all uh, the, well, the workhorses mm -hmm. running in the cloud, which is only an internal solution, but they didn't tell us. <laughs> yeah. And that was unfortunate because keep, people got really confused about that. Oh, is Citrix building their own like Azure-like environment or AWS environment? And that was very confusing, and in particular for the partners. So what's going to happen to the partners? Is Citrix going to offer these services directly? And uh, as a matter of fact, they explained us later, this is not the case. This was only like a showcase where Citrix used their own data center resources to run the workloads to demonstrate these things at Synergy. But it was not clear. It was not clearly communicated. Yeah. So You're talking about the test drive. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And most people thought this is the new yep. product offering. This is a new, uh, well, cloud yes. product offering, which in fact it's not. Workspace cloud in a box. Correct, correct. <laughs> but it's only for demo purposes. It's only like for pre-sales. And, and that makes a huge difference if you tell people that it's only meant for pre-sales and like demonstration proof and of proof of concept. And later you move everything to your own work horses on-prem. Yeah. Right. Or if you decide you want to want to host it at a hoster, fine. So Citrix is, is not, uh, well, dealing with that kind of business model yet. But that was not, <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. And, and, it, and that was not very clear articulated. And I thought this created more confusion than it should have. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, so this is what, I, what, what my take is on that. I, I like the technology. It's a great idea. It's the right move. Yeah. But it was not explained in the right way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any, any more comments? Alex has a comment. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm talking to you, Alex. <laughs> but uh, how about this? Adjusted. Look at this uh, technology-wise, right? I think things are a little bit more it's, uh, concrete, right? More settled than the licensing situation. If somebody depends on Microsoft to come up with a licensing model, which I don't think we started with Microsoft. <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. Citrix depends on Microsoft licensing, right? 
Yeah. So it's legal. It's the fact, right? So when things kind of settle, like Amazon is settling their licensing situation with Microsoft. The same thing, Microsoft with Azure. We're not sure, like if you look at MVP conversation, with Microsoft also things kind of in the air. Uh, that does impact potential business model, even if technology is available to date, right? So I bet the monetizing of this technology is getting in the way of technology itself. Like I said, it confused the partners. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. They don't know what, what they can do with this technology. They just don't know. And and I think you have to make it very clear that the uh, Workspace Cloud is all about getting your standard infrastructure components being hosted by Citrix in the cloud, Correct. making sure that they are updated and, and have their life cycle management done by the experts and, and those that have the knowledge of the technology. We should have, we should have done that. Yeah, we should have done that. <laughs> well, there's still time for next year, so <laughs> I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> and, and it allows all the customers and partners to ensure that all customizations that are on the desktops and on the hosted shared platform, that is still your, uh, in your control because the control plane is hosted by Citrix and you still have the ability to host your own uh, Zen app, Zen desktop, um, um, hosted shared uh, desktops, servers and be able to combine the yeah. two connect them together. Yeah. To give the choice. It's all about choice, right? That's yeah, what it is. It's yeah, choice. definitely. You've so, seen it with FMA and the connectors yeah, and to AWS and Yeah, and making sure that you can host your uh, servers and desktops on Azure or another cloud platform, but it's not, at least for now, it's not the intention of Citrix to have a complete desktop as a service okay. Uh, okay. platform out there. Okay. So I do think that uh, even though we as a partners have to change our added value oh, yeah, to our customers because it will all be about the customization and making sure that we get the apps to our users. Very good. Uh, but I think it's a good thing that Citrix allows us to plug into their knowledge and their lifecycle management for the products. So, very good. Yeah. Okay, so for it. I think that's it. So very good. I take a big round of applause for our CTPs. Take a bow, take a bow. Box out. And our special guest as well. <laughs> okay, so I think we've come to the end. Uh, we didn't have a huge amount of time. I'm sorry if we didn't fit more in. Uh, the NetScale 11. Yeah, Net Zen Server 65, <laughs> Service Pack 1. There's a lot more stuff, of course, uh, but I'll be available tomorrow later on. And if anybody wants to talk about, you know, cloud workspace, uh, we, can, we can do so later on at some stage, and I can show you some screenshots from some various decks and stuff like that. But uh, I think that's pretty much it for now. So, thank you very much.